Excellent. Hey, thank you very much uh, for that, and, and thanks very much for, for having me here uh, today down in Gisborne. I'm embarrassed to say it's been about 20 years since I've been to Gisborne, so it's, uh, it's nice, to, nice to get back. Um, so just very briefly on that, that intro, um, it's always I guess, humbling for me to come to rooms that actually got people that are owning and starting and, and have their own businesses and they're real entrepreneurs, because I think it makes you know, people like myself who have got jobs with businesses seem actually quite easy by comparison. So, so hopefully you know, today what I can do is, is tell you a bit about, I guess, the Desperate, Desperate story and what we're doing, um, and I guess also try and relate some of the things that uh, that Zespri is doing and I guess our structure and how that might sort of work through, I guess also from a regional perspective, but also as we look at some of the industries that are that are active down here in, in Gisborne and try and guess give a bit of a bit of our experience or my experience in that area for you guys and what you're doing. So just just briefly on that background, um, I came out of uh, came out of Auckland, was in Wellington for a few years, um, actually about ten years with uh, foreign affairs down there doing um, the trade negotiation space. So I was Lucky enough to get involved in some of the things like the China FTAs and the, the work through ASEAN and, and uh, the other work we did there. Um, and then ended up at, at Zespri, um, heading up our, our, what was the start of our government relations actually um, work. Um, found myself for, for all the wrong reasons for Zespri, uh, up in China, um, trying, to, trying to deal with some of the issues we had. I don't know if you guys remember the media, we had a few importation issues in China. So I got, uh, so I got, I got banished to Shanghai to go and, to go and sort out uh, our, our distribution and, and structure up there. And off the back of that, ended up uh, in, uh, in Southern California um, for, for, for the right reasons, uh, doing the, the same thing there around structure and distribution and, and setting up uh, our path to market in the US and then landed back in New Zealand this year. So, so a bit of a, a broad background and, and hopefully I guess pass on a, a bit of my insights and what I've seen from not just this but other companies coming through that we've worked with and talked to as well. I'll race through a bit of the, the corporate the corporate fluff, I'd, I'd call it, just to, to set the scene. Um, hopefully everyone knows, knows Zespri and, and, and what we do. Um, we do kiwi fruit, uh, just kiwi fruit, just fresh kiwi fruit, no, no downstream products, no value add stuff, just fresh fruits, this is what we do. 100% um, export business, so everything we do in Zespri is, is sent offshore to the offshore markets. What you see in New Zealand, if it's got a Zespri sticker, has come through from, I guess, the, the second class or third class fruit that, that gets sold locally, so everything we do is entirely offshore shore focused. Um, the humble little kiwi fruit's gone pretty well for New Zealand and, and for our growers. So, you know, we've got our a target of, of being 4.5 billion um, by 2025, which is rapidly approaching. Um, but that's gone pretty quickly, and, and, and we're pretty confident of our ability to, to get the industry there and, and to get those those returns coming back. Um, and beyond that as well, it's also starting to take the expertise that we have and, and the knowledge of our growers in New Zealand and growing out our 12-month strategy, so now starting to, to grow in offshore locations as well to, to give ourselves a, a truly global business, and I'll, I'll touch on that in a bit. Um, so not particularly big as a company, we've got about 2,500 growers uh, here in New Zealand. Um, they're spread all around the show. We've got about, it says there, uh, 13,500 hectares, so, so in New Zealand scale, pretty big. We're, we're over half of all the horticulture exports that, that leave New Zealand, so by comparison, that's about twice the size of the, the pit fruit industry out of New Zealand. Um, so, you know, uh, quite, a, quite a big player in the New Zealand context. Globally, it's pretty small. So kiwi fruit is about half a percent of the world's fruit bowl. And so when you look at all the other fruits that, that are out there that we're competing against, it's a pretty challenging, pretty challenging environment. And then when we look at, uh, for comparison, in the United States, um, where we were, we were number 22 in the in the fruit bowl in, in America. So basically, what that means is Americans recalled 21 other fruit before they would consider buying a kiwi fruit. So, you know, some challenging different dynamics and places we go. Taiwan, by comparison, we outsell bananas. So where we are across the world is, is, is varied in some ways. US in particular, we're actually a startup business, so not dissimilar to what some of you guys are doing. Other places, we're, we're, we're quite, a big, um, quite a big brand. Um, this is what New Zealand looks like for us. So, so here in Gisborne, it's about two percent of our of our um, of our production comes out of here. 
um, increasing though actually so so a lot of the big developments we see coming through now the new plantings are actually happening down in this region um, so you know it's obviously very similar I guess to where the, the bulk is there in, in the Bay of Plenty but in terms of land availability up around the bay is getting pretty tight so we're starting to see some some great new developments happen down here which is which is uh, I guess pretty exciting and also which is really positive too uh, actually a lot of investment coming through from um, from Maori entities and, and Maori growers as well which has been a really good success story for us actually around the Cape around getting investment back into to Māori communities and, and land that's coming through. But by and large, very much the Bay of Plenty, um, great rainfall, great soils, um, proximity to the port is fantastic. Um, so this is what we look like from where we grow. This is our, our challenge and our opportunity. So, so currently we're doing, uh, so this is last year's volumes, that we did about 170 million trays. In the next little while, 2025, that, that jumps to 263 million. Um, if, you're a, if you're a grower, that's a fantastic story because it means you're selling lots more fruit. If you're a marketer and the person selling it, you look at it and think, man, that's going to be hard work. But it is a really opportunity story for, for the industry and, and, and we've certainly got really great market signals coming through that so we've got some very strong demand coming through and this has been reflected in the confidence in the industry growing it through. So we call this our, our gold tsunami of, of fruit that's coming coming on with the, the new gold variety, you know, really being picked up well by, by growers. And the demand for that we're seeing now, you know, the, um, in the tender bid for the new licence when we bring it out last year, somewhere around $270,000 per hectare is the licence price now, it's just reflecting the value that's coming back from the industry and, and the value that growers are putting on getting access to, to gold fruit. Um, it's, it's a pretty good position, in fact the previous speaker mentioned that, that um, monopolies are good uh, and, and that is actually I guess, and we'll touch on that structure, but it's a bit of the advantage that Desperate's got here and, and it's probably, uh, and we're a little bit biased on this, it's one of the best things that New Zealand's got in terms of business structure for how we, how we sell out into the markets in terms of obtaining scale. So scale is, is the key to what we do in the market and it's, it's allowed us to take essentially what's been a commodity product for a lot of the world and we look at a lot of the other places that grow kiwi fruit, um, their offering in the markets is very much a commodity based um, kind of a piece of fruit so very little brand development, very little marketing in what they do. By comparison, zespri has been able to take that same fruit and really put a real value add story around that both in terms of our varieties but just how we position it as well. The big, the big player in this one here, which is really starting to come through, is, is China. So, so China produces more than the rest of the world put together. At this stage, it's, it's, it's of varying qualities and largely consumed, consumed locally. But it's an area that we've, we've been watching pretty closely in terms of production opportunities. And, and if you've seen the, the media in the last couple of days, actually, now an issue we're dealing with, with, um, with actually quite considerable plantings of, of our PVR gold variety now, now becoming pretty, um, pretty prevalent up in China as well. So we're now working pretty hard to understand how we can address that challenge of controlling essentially you know, our, our PVR leakage up in the China market, um, which is, which is you know, a difficult place to try and control those sort of things. Things, but, but certainly an opportunity in that market um, and, a, and a, certainly a very, very big sales market for Zespri. Um, essentially, and I touched on before, the structure of Zespri and, and I guess what makes Con unique is we, we sit very much in the centre of the industry. So, so Zespri doesn't own anything, we don't have orchards, we don't have Oh, actually, we now have a new office, but that's about the only asset that, that Zespri owns. So we specialise very much just in the marketing and the logistics of fruit. So we work around getting that fruit um, from the growers onto the ships, out into the market, and then we look after all the market-based stuff around the, the brand and how we advertise and sell that fruit. And we do that by working with a whole lot of players there. Post-harvest obviously is a major, a major partner of ours. The growers were essentially a cooperative, so everything we do is about getting that return and lifting that value back to the growers to make sure that they are you know, successful and this is a, a viable, profitable business for them. And at the market side, it's, it's working right back from the consumers, right the way back through to, to the growers. Um, and again, that previous speaker touched on how important data is and data is becoming in businesses. So even in, in agriculture industries like ourselves, we're now starting to look really, really heavily into how we can use data and capture data from the end consumers to link that right back to how our growers are actually growing. So getting information about what consumers want, what sort of tastes they're after, what varieties, what colours, what sort of textures and firmness they want, 
and sending those signals right back through into, into our growing community to make sure that ultimately the consumer is getting what they want because that's, that's what it's about, right? The profit comes from getting consumers what they want. So using that information to send all those signals back down to our growers, and, and I'll touch on that in a, in a little bit as well. And we also talk very much about, I guess, the Zespri system. So in our business, we, we refer to this quite a lot. Um, and essentially, it's, it's, it's the, the IP, if you like, of, of our business and what we do is, is the whole quality system that starts from the orchards, right the way through post-harvest, right the way through to the quality that consumers get. And so there's no real secret to what Zespri does and, and that the fruit we put out there, there's no one thing that is. It's a whole lot of little steps along the way around managing quality, managing inputs, managing the standard of, of fruit that comes off. So when and how growers can, can pick their fruit, what standards of maturity they have to be at to get to, to harvest, all little things that by themselves are pretty simple but put right across the supply chain allow us to actually really control things um, quite effectively um, and with our relationships with sale as well. Where our competitors uh, in the market fail is they don't have the ability to coordinate their systems like Zespri does. So if you look at Chile, who is, who is probably our, our only Southern Hemisphere competitor, you know, similar size production to New Zealand, every year, and it's actually the biggest problem for Zespri, every year at the start of harvest, there's probably about 29 or so Chilean recognised exporters race their fruit to market off the vines as fast as they can get it off there, hard as rock, sour, terrible tasting fruit, and they race it out to market as fast as they can to try and get that early money. What it does is give consumers a terrible eating experience, drives the price down, and it means that we're coming in afterwards. In some ways it's a benefit because the taste difference is so good, in other ways, it's hard because you've got consumers, particularly in developing markets, who are used to eating this this horrible bit of you know bit of fruit that's been sour and rock hard, and, and they go off the industry. So in a lot of markets, we're actually going in trying to re-educate consumers about actually what a good piece of kiwi fruit is. But at the same time, you're also trying to convince them to pay in some areas, you know, two or three times the price of a, of a competitor piece of fruit to get that value proposition across. But what we do is have very strict criteria to get that quality so that when our fruit hits the market, it's all of exact same consistency, whether it's size and, and shape and, and, but importantly, taste. So that each time people buy a zestful bit of fruit, it's the same as the last one they bought. It's kind of the McDonald's approach to what we do. It's, it's everywhere in the world you go, it's the same eating experience, which is the challenge. And that comes through that, that zestful system that we talk about for, for consistency. Um, innovation is a, is a massive part of it as well, and this is true for, for every industry. Um, staying ahead of, of, of the, the competitors and staying ahead of what the consumer wants is, is, a, is a huge part of it. And so we spend a, a, a lot of money annually. We have about a 30 million budget each year in, in innovation around trying to find new ways of doing things, better ways of growing, better things to be, to be using on our orchards and, and with our growers and obviously, you know, new varieties. Um, and the new varieties is, is where a, a huge amount of focus goes to, to make sure that when there is a new product ready to go to market, that, that we're the ones that are, that are leading that way. Um, up in, up in Tapuki, we, we have what's the, what is the, the world's largest breeding program. So at any time, there's about 100,000 different varieties that we've got in the ground. And that's a continual process of going through and trying to pick out what the good attributes are from, from any one of those, those 100,000 seedlings and trying to do those crosses and get that mix right to try and get that next variety. That process there from, from having a, a, a clonal um, evaluation through to actually getting something to market, it's about 15 years. So there's a huge amount of time and investment um, and, and we work pretty hard to try and speed up the science in this to get it out there. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a tough, tough job trying to get something that is going to be both productive, that looks great, that tastes great, but also most importantly is, is profitable. You know, there's some fantastic pieces of fruit that we've, we've passed by just because it's not something that growers can grow easily uh, and get you know, sufficient volumes out of their orchards. But innovation is a massive part of what we do and it's again part of that Zespri collective structure 
gives us the ability to actually fund things in the innovation space and to do the work there that you know otherwise our, 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 um, our competitors or even other fruit industries don't have that opportunity to do. Um, certainly Sun Gold, which is our, our new gold, which has been and very much was the, the, the saviour of the industry after PSA when our, our previous gold succumbed to, uh, to the bacterial disease we had came through was something that had come through our breeding program and, and, and very much was <laughs> the right place at right time with our new variety that came through, came through that system. Sustainability is, is also a, a really big thing now for, for the industry. I guess in some ways it always has been and she was just talking to, uh, to uh, on the way to the, to, the, to the venue here today saying that in some ways, um, you know, Zespri's not, not been late to the party, but it's something that we've kind of, uh, we've just taken for granted, you know, horticulture industry, it's outside, it's, it's, it's you know, it doesn't have the, the obvious um, negatives that some other industries have. But now we're really starting to take a look at this and saying, well, this is, this is super important. And right across our industry, where are the things that we can be doing that actually really make a difference on this? You know, plastics in the supply chain, for example, is a major one, um, not just for, for our consumers, but, but retailers as well. And, and certainly a lot of the messaging and feedback and, and very blunt um, dialogue we're having with our partners, and particularly in Europe, but right throughout the US and other places as well as they don't want to see plastic in, in, in packaging anymore. You take a market like the US where almost 100% of our fruit is repacked into, into, um, into plastic punnets, and that's, you know, that's across the industry, that's not just kiwi fruit. It's a major challenge to start to change some of those, those things in the supply chain and, and come up with viable options that are also cost effective, because ultimately you know, you've got to be able to afford to do these things as well. But you know, water use on orchards, nitrates, all those sort of things, a lot of focus now going on to, into the business. And in fact, this is one of our, our key pillars now at Zespri is really taking a look at sustainability and what it means for our industry, both at the market side, right down to things that we do actually in the office ourselves. So the new building we've got is you know, solar paneled, grey water, all those little things to try and actually live, live by our own ideals around sustainability and then flow that right through into what we're doing in the market as well. Um, and I say that's, that, that pays off um, both because it's the right thing to do as a, as a company, our consumers are seeing it and customers are seeing it and it reinforces and drives that business proposition. So more than ever, this is, this is really, really a real thing out there in markets, in particular the retailers around what companies are doing in that sustainability space. Um, and, and branding, you know, branding is, is the one thing that, that, that disregards, you know, we are, we are effectively a, a, a marketing company. So, you know, each year we're spending around $150 million a year, which, which in the fruit industry is, is pretty big. So you, you've got the likes of your Dole maybe, um, is probably the other company that, that's in a similar level of, of what spend is around it. And it allows us to completely differentiate that Zespri product from not just other kiwi fruit, but also from other fruit products in that market. And again, that comes from having that structure that we do that allows us to invest, to pool our resources, and pretty importantly, actually, just to focus on a single New Zealand brand in the market, because that gives us that space in there to not be competing, not only with the international competitors, we're not competing with ourselves when we get to market. Competition happens onshore around post-harvest and who growers want to grow with and that sort of area. But when we get offshore, we're all part of that one Zespri team and a one brand that people see. And that gives us the ability to do a lot of pretty cool stuff from the, from the fruit industry, which is still in some areas quite a traditional trading or, or wholesale based business, to really do a lot of good stuff around our campaigns and, and, and how we sell our fruit offshore. Um, and, and we look at a lot of the work around, you know, why are people buying their fruit? Why are people eating what they eat? How are people eating that fruit? to tailor what we're doing. And so some of the things around, um, which again is, is kind of unusual for a, for a fruit business or agricultural business to be looking at is around decisions people are making about, for example, um, snack foods. So, so snacking is, is, is the new thing in, in, the, in the world of consumption. People aren't so much sitting down having meals. People are grabbing convenience food on the go. They're looking at um, health as part of that. They want something that's convenient and they can get, you know, get on the go for it. And so it's working out how you can fit your products into consumers' lives now, which is important. For, for years, we've been jealous of the banana because the banana is the, the ultimate snack food, right? It comes in its own packaging. You can chuck it in your bag. It's good. 
kiwi fruit's kind of kind of hard to do that with. But um, but you know, it's uh, a lot of people offshore. A lot of kiwis here. We will eat the whole thing. We will bite it in half. A lot of people offshore aren't quite sure what to do with the kiwi fruit. So a lot of marketing and you know work now and trying to educate people how to eat kiwi fruit properly and also but fitting it into this image of a snacking lifestyle uh, and convenience as well. Um, and health is that big one too. So, and again, having just come out of the US for a couple of years, this is very much uh, at the forefront of people's minds. People making purchase decisions based on what's good for them and what's good for their families. And so we, we spend a, a lot of time and a lot of money on, on researching the health properties. And this actually leads a lot of our marketing. And so through Asia in particular, um, we, we, we're almost marketing kiwi fruit as a health supplement as opposed to a piece of fruit because people are making the decisions on, on buying fruit because it's good for them. So the whole digestion parts of kiwi fruit, the whole vitamin C, um, the digestive health uh, and gut health that comes from kiwi fruit, a lot of uh, effort put into educating consumers around what goodness you get from a kiwi fruit as well as the taste, uh, taste attributes as well. And so that's quite a deliberate shift in, in marketing ourselves out to here for what people want not just so that we're competing alongside an apple or a banana or an orange on a shelf. People are making that choice. And in fact, you know, a few years back I used to look after our, our, um, our Far East Russian business and you know, Russia's a few years back not the most economically viable market at that time. People were making decisions and were choosing to pay more for kiwi fruit because they were doing that because they knew that they could give their family or their children better vitamin density for that spend than they could have by buying other pieces of fruit together. So they were actually making conscious decisions on how much, how much health can I get for my money. And that was in a, in a, um, quite an interesting thing to see how people were working in it so that the dollar wasn't putting them off, you know, higher priced fruit. It was around what they were putting into their, into their kids. Um, so, so I realised that for a lot of, a lot of businesses, you know, Zespri scale is, is, is quite, quite different and, and often the challenge is, well, how do I take what Zespri does with 150 million bucks of marketing and, and 500 staff and, and apply it to, to, to your own business or to your own industries? And, and so I guess if I, I, I look and I've tried to sort of think about, you know, what are some of the things that, that, that Zespri has and does that are relevant? And, I mentioned earlier on that the, the real key to what we, we, we do and have is scale. So, so the collaborative nature or the or structure of our business, which essentially is that, for, for want of a better word, you know, that, that single desk structure, it gives us scale. So when we hit the market, uh, whether it is, you know, the US or Asia or Europe, wherever it is, we've actually got the scale to be able to serve customers. We've got the budgets to be able to do our marketing. We've got budgets to be able to do the advertising and promotion and research behind it. That if we were 10, 15, 20 different export businesses doing that, just simply wouldn't exist. And so the, the real strength to what we have is the ability to actually get out there with some volume. And this is a real challenge for, for New Zealand companies. Often scale is, is, is huge. I mean, we used to have a family business in, in the wine industry. And I remember there was a, um, a request to do a, to do a promo or a, a promotional um, run for, I think it was Sainsbury's in the UK. It was just a, a, a testing promo. And to do that promo would have taken the entire production for that winery for that year just to do it. You know, so it couldn't, it couldn't take those opportunities due to this, those scale limitations. And so that, the, the, the real key to that is, is what, it, what it gives us the ability to get out there. And it also allows us to, to have specialisation across the industry. So was Esprit looking after the marketing, looking after the market side and how we position in market? It lets our growers focus on what, what they are experts at. They are, they are amazing growers and that's what we need them to be. And so they can focus on what they do on Orchard and they can be excellent at that and then we can go and be excellent and do our best on the marketing side. And so often you'll get you know, New Zealand companies that you've got the entrepreneur is, is the developer, the marketer, the, the exporter, the person that's paying the bills and, and sweeping the floor at the same time. And obviously it, it takes time to get that scale. But, but the specialisation and having some people focus on what their, their areas are is a real key to that. And whether it's within industries or um, with brands, and we've seen some great examples in, in the wine industry, for example, with, uh, I think it's the family of 12 that have, that have got together and jointly market and promote themselves at offshore, offshore trade fairs, you know, bringing their, their dollars together 
is a, is a good way to try and get some of that scale and, and cut through that, that individually you, you can't get hold of. And, and we saw a lot of that, particularly in, in, in China, with the companies coming up and just struggling to get that foothold because they, they didn't have the ability to have staff on the ground or in, in markets. Um, the single inventory we have also, and again this comes back to scale, it allows us to, to, to optimise that crop to what the customers want. So at, at, the, at the large scale of that, our Japanese market, which has for years been our, our, our most profitable market at, on a per trade basis, they, they like and pay great money for very sweet fruit. So we, we have our fruit is all graded both by obviously quality, but, but taste is one of the big ones. So we can grade our fruit by, by how that fruit tastes. We segregate the best of that fruit from a, from a taste perspective off, that goes to Japan. And so we know that we're giving that market and those consumers exactly what they want, exactly what they'll pay for. In China, in the north, uh, northeast of China, uh, that area, they like big fruit. That they will pay money and they prefer to have a larger size fruit than the small account that you can put into other markets. And so we, we segment that off and that market gets that big fruit that they want. And so it's the ability to actually start to give customers, look, whether it's on a country scale or actually at a, at a customer um, scale, what they want, which is a trick to actually to making the customer or consumer happy. And so by having a single inventory or broader inventory, we can do that in a way that if you were just having to deal with a smaller crop going out there, you just don't have that ability to do. And that's actually quite unique for, for what we have in, in terms of being able to make sure we're, we're optimising the fruit we have to get the most money for that as well. And it's similar with, with actually how we spread it. So we sell in, in the previous slide said 59 different countries. Some of those are, are, are much more profitable than others. So, so the Chinas and the, and the um, Japans of the world, in some cases can, can be double the return of, of another market, but we're still putting fruit there. And we do that so that we are not saturating our markets that are those higher returning ones. The worst thing we could do was, is, is all of a sudden put everything we've got into Japan and China and those places and, and, and pull that whole price structure down. So by controlling where we put our fruit and again not racing everything to market is, is, is important for us. And we see that with our, with, our, you know, with our competitors offshore, the fruit follows the dollar. And so all of a sudden if, if the market's playing well, all of a sudden everyone else's fruit's heading to that market and it crashes. You know, our ability to, to manage our markets across is, is, a, is a really important one for us. That structure and that single voice, again, is important. New Zealand's a pretty small country, and, and in a lot of areas, it's difficult. There's not the space to have 15 different brands all fighting to get space within a Costco or a Ole or whatever it might be in a supermarket. You know, they are going to take one at best, maybe it might be two, but we're competing with ourselves in a lot of time to get that same limited shelf space often with that same New Zealand story. And so what the, what the kiwi fruit, uh, I guess, structure allows us to do is, is have a single brand that goes out there. People want to take Zespri fruit, New Zealand fruit in there, they're buying Zespri, and that Zespri takes shelf space, and that's what it is. We're not battling with our neighbour down the road to try and undercut them and get them into that market. And so that's a really useful um, and very strong position for us to have because that becomes synonymous then with that New Zealand brand and, and what it means under that, that Zespri label. Um, again, just touching that, it allows us to really maximise that spend and that branding. It's one promotion for one brand and what we're doing. And it helps us get talent, you know. A, a, a bit of scale there allows us to make, make sure that we are getting the good advertising companies, we are getting good staff attracted to work for the business, we are getting you know, specialists in because we've got that consolidation there and, and a bit of scale for it. Um, we, we, at times, this can, be, this can be frustrating, but we do have a, a, a very strong um, industry ethos of, of everyone, everyone grows together um, and so because of that co-op structure that we've got there, innovation, new varieties, new products, new on orchard techniques, the industry learns together and so when someone has got a, an idea or there's some research or there's a, something application comes on, it's a new way to do it that's girdling on orchards, it's stringing, it's overheads, canopies, whatever it might be, the industry picks up and goes together with it. So what we've seen is the whole industry lift rather than having you know, individual companies or players race out ahead of it. And as a result, the industry has done pretty well out of that. So we've, we've put um, a lot of effort with our 
orchard productivity team that gets out there and works on orchard and does field days with growers around productivity things. A new variety is obviously accessible right out there across the industry. Um, information shared with growers across uh, across the country through um, through Canopy and the other um, communication tools we have, um, and through field days and those sort of things with growers too. Um, and then on a on a on a government level, uh, and this has been important. You know, we, we do have the ability of having one voice talking to government. So where it's around market access issues, our current issues, for example, around the varieties in China, um, when we had um, the PSA issues. Having a single voice that can be talking with government or the regulators or MPI or offshore markets allows us to really narrow those conversations down and get a lot more a lot more traction as a result of that. And so we find that when we have had issues, um, the ability to get down to Wellington and get the access that, that we're after, um, you know, people pick up the phone, which is which is really important um, for us at times. And and the government's been hugely helpful. Um, just a couple of observations for me, uh, having seen uh, a number of companies come through, in particular the, the Asian markets, but also the US uh, as well, um, for, for companies that are coming out and starting to export. And and um, one observation I make is is that exporting is is expensive you know it, it does take resource it does take a plan and a strategy and you can burn cash really quickly if you if you're not thinking stuff through in, a, in time now that's a really obvious statement but taking the time to plan a strategy and 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 research those markets and and know what you want to do because there are a huge amount of ways to do things if you look at you know just those to, you know the markets i'm most familiar with you know the channels for your for your market are you wholesale are you going to go to retail what sort of retail are you going to are you high end are you going to uh to a, are you a whole foods customer or are you a costco customer in the us are you, are you niche um what's the distribution model is it a retail where you're going to go up there and, and directly sell to retail and staff that yourself or is it best to be partnering with distributors or, or looking at JV things? There's a range of different options there and, and understanding and knowing the strengths and weaknesses and opportunities of all those is really important because they can be, they can be very different and, and very different outcomes for your, for your business. Knowing that competitive landscape again, you know, who are you competing against, and what is that? What is that point of difference that you bring it with your product? You know, what is what is the story and, and that compelling, if you like, um, that moment where someone is going to make that decision to change from what they've been doing, and all of a sudden to buy your product? And this was this is very real for us in the U.S. Like I say, as a startup, there, what is it that's going to convince a, a, an American? mum or dad who for the last 30 years has bought the same apples, bananas and a pear you know, as part of their weekly shop, what is going to make them stop and decide all of a sudden to try a fruit they don't really know anything about is comparatively really expensive, why would they do that? And so thinking through what is the thing that's going to change someone's mind to, to make that decision, is, is, it's hard but it's a really important thing to try and work out what is going to change a consumer's buying behaviours to give my, my product a shot, um, and and you know and you know we talked about the previous speaker around around failing you know and 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 failure is a, a constant I guess within innovation but but mitigating failure is also quite good to do <laughs> because it'd be awesome if failure wasn't a good thing and success was what we were going for so 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 what are the things that can go wrong what are the challenges what am I likely to come against and mitigating where you can with that um, a, a big plug for the New Zealand Inc story out there, um, particularly for smaller businesses, NZT and your embassies can, can, can save you a lot of time and they can be, they can be really, really effective for you. My advice is, is, is get there early, talk to them early, find someone in one of those agencies and latch onto them <laughs> because if you've got someone who's on your side and, and working with you that you can pick up the phone with and have those conversations, you get a lot more traction doing that than just than, than uh, I guess being a random business that every now and again calls through. Uh, my my favourite, um, uh, which is a geek story really, but my favourite trade negotiation story when we were talking with, with uh, Southeast Asia, there was a very small onion exporter um, who who weekly would ring the lead negotiator, and this guy has a, a very small business, and he would harangue the trade negotiator about what the outcome was going to be for onions. And I remember the negotiator at the end of it saying he was so paranoid about having to go back to New Zealand and talk to this onion grower, he didn't get a good deal for, for onions, that his, in his whole way through this negotiation, onions was at the forefront of his mind for it. And that's, and that's what you want, that, that you want people to be thinking that about your business, you know, so, and, 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 and trust me, the, 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 the negotiators, the embassies, the entities, 
they love having companies to work with that are engaged and do things with them. So, so absolutely, you know, take them up or, or, or get into their get into their heads. Um, and it's important that it'll stretch your budget. They do some great stuff that you can get up there, whether it's trade shows, whether it's working with other um, like industries to get up there, help get some scale through what you're doing with what NZ Inc's doing up there as well. Um, and I'll just, you know, the last one is, is, is learn from those other mistakes that, that people are making, you know. Ask questions, ask all the dumb questions, ask them 10 times and, and forums like this are fantastic for talking to everyone else about what they're doing and, and what they've experienced because often the stories and, and challenges are the same. So, um, you know, do that. Learn from everyone else and, and, and think about how to get that scale in, in, in what you're doing. Um, so the first one is, how can Gisborne capitalise on Zespri's work? Plant some kiwi fruit for you. Be good to do. Um, no, look. I mean, I, I guess if the, if the questions around context for other industries. I mean, to me, I guess it's some of those those things around how to collectively get some scale in what we do. You know, and is are there opportunities for 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 different companies or players to work together and really try and get some scale in what what you're doing in the offshore markets? Because it, it, it is you know it can be tough out there if, if the, you're not getting that collaboration and, and working together on stuff. That'd be my my take. What might you look for in an offshore collaboration? Oh, um, so I mean, one and the same thing is the key to it, right? I mean, there there we've 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 been burnt a number of times by distributors and players that that have a different um, a different end goal from what you're after, um, and you really want to be in there with players that have got a long a a long term strategy to work with you that are happy to, 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 to jointly invest with you so they've got skin in the game of what you're doing as well. Um, and that, that mix has got to be right. I mean, it's a, it's a very soft skill thing, right? But you, you, you've got to feel comfortable with the partners you've got in, in dealing with it. If it's not, it's, it can be very, very hard um, to do that. But, you know, alignment of ideals, alignment of what you're trying to achieve, um, and particularly, you know, as Kiwis, we have a very strong ideal about what, what our business stands for, what our brand stands for. You know, you want players that, that are in that same mindset, I guess, with it. Um, preferably ones that don't under-declare duties at customs is always good as well, um, as a, from experience. How do you protect your brand and assure authenticity to consumers? Is counterfeit packaging, et cetera, an issue? And if so, how have you mitigated this? Uh, yeah, so that, so market by market, very different, but but yes, it, it is a major issue. So, um, so, so we have... For, so for our gold variety, um, our, you know, where we own the, the rights, that so we have that that plant variety or PVR registered in, in all the countries we, we operate in, which gives us obviously the the, the legal or civil legal right to, to protect and and to go after any violations of of that product. Um, globally, the, the major problems we've had around counterfeit have been in, in the China market. Uh, in China, there is there is you know quite large scale. Um, counterfeit of, of both the Zespri brand itself and, and now as I mentioned you know seeing the actual the, the variety itself being grown up there now which is you know obviously unauthorised plantings of, of our variety we, we work very closely with, with our obviously legal teams up there um, we, we work very closely with the New Zealand and, and Chinese governments to try and get um, action and, and the legal platform to, to deal with, with that um, we have to and it's very important that we, we take a pretty strong um, line on on um, on counterfeit and, and PVRs because ultimately it's it's our growers brand they own the brand they own the variety there's a huge amount of investment that goes into the, those varieties and so we've got to do everything we can to, to try and maximize that so in China we've got teams that monitor wholesale markets and, and take legal action um, you know regularly against any any brands that we see um, uh, that are that are either copying or, or coming close to that Zespri brand um, but, and traceability is a big area we're certainly looking at now around how do you get that authentic, um, whether it's QR codes or it might be, to assure a customer you've got it. Care for it, it's hard. We've got you know a couple of billion individual pieces of fruit going out there, so at a per piece level, it's quite hard to try and work that through. But certainly, it's something that we we are you know we're really active on on that front, and and wherever we see anything that's there, we, we act pretty quick. Sustainability. How will you be able to tell the grower and post-harvest facility sustainability story, or will the story be from shipping to market? 
Um, that sustainability story is, go, goes right through. Um, and so so certainly what we're seeing, which is, you know, fantastic, is, is a, a lot of the post-harvest players are, are, are really ahead of where Zespri is in that sustainability story. So got some companies doing some, some fantastic stuff around sustainability and, and also in the broadest sense of sustainability. So, you know, how, how we are treating and attracting staff that, that work for people you know, in terms of wages and that sort of area, um, you know, conditions for, for people, um, but also obviously, you know, what we're putting on our orchards and how we're, we're, we're measuring what we do now. The biggest challenge in the past for us has been measuring, you know, are we making any movement around nitrates and water usage and those things? So we're about to, to launch, in fact, early next year, a, a whole lot of new, I guess, targets and, and things that as an industry we want to be measuring and, and we'll hold ourselves too in, in that space but but certainly post harvest are, are, are right there and they are because that's the very competitive part of the industry you know growers are choosing who they they pack with um, and so that's important for them almost as you like as, as customers of post harvest so those guys are, are absolutely right there with us um, and it's a message that goes you know right through to consumers how much consideration does Esper give to the rest of the Hort section when talking market access internationally? Um, yeah, yeah, quite a bit. I mean, obviously, um, a lot of the you know some of our issues are specific to to kiwi fruit, whether it's around um, and again where we've had specific issues around you know fungus or whatever it might be into markets. But but pretty much when we're talking um, at a at a at a government level, it's usually a, a pretty good cross section of industries that are there talking together. So, generally, you know, so up in um, Beijing a few months ago, there's you know roundtable forums, soil fern farms, ourselves, the Apple guys are all there as part of that conversation. So, there actually is a really good and MPI are fantastic this offshore, a, a really good representation of those key industries that sit down, sit down, and, and get those dialogues and conversations um, with with government um, and actually. Having a, a group of companies together do that is, is sometimes a lot easier to get that um, that face time with with foreign governments and agencies than by ourselves. But um, yeah, we 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 try and do as much as we can. We we work pretty closely with, for example, the avocado guys. We we do a bit with them certainly up in the markets around how we can look to to, to leverage each other and what they're doing in in terms of um, you know market successes and and distributors. We talk a lot with the Apple guys around, you know, who they're working with and, and how they're doing their distribution as well. So, you know, it's great. Once you get offshore, there's a there's a pretty good pretty good collaboration. One last one, and apologies, there are more than one here, but let's do this one. What makes the kiwifruit industry different now to the 1980s? Oh, um, <laughs> the returns. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so the, the Zespri. So the answer is the regulations, right? So, so, so kiwi fruit went through that classic boom and bust um, back in back in the eighties, where there was huge overplanting, um, massive competition with people going out to the export markets and no real consolidation with it. So as a result of that and as a result of people literally, you know, losing their orchards and losing their shirt over over this bust in the industry, that's when growers went to to get that that single desk set up. So that was it was that crisis that led to the, the regs being set up that that created Zespri at growers' request to have a single exporting body and that's led to, to the stuff we touched on earlier around you know just having that single voice f for for all kiwi fruit out in those markets and and it's and it's been a you know a, a really good growth story since then we, we'll be tested and we are every year by the returns to the growers you know as soon as Zespri drops the ball on on what it's doing in the markets or returns start to take a hit that's when the pressure comes on and so that's what drives us to keep getting those returns as much as we can and performing the markets because as soon as that starts to, to waver, we do a bad job in that, that's when there'll be problems for it. And so that's what really keeps Zespri focused on, on doing what it can because it, it is a privileged position to have to be that single that single um, channel for growers. But you know, we're, we're now getting some some pretty amazing returns coming back out of the markets, particularly for the gold guys. But you know, green growth has been been pretty pretty phenomenal as well, which is which has been great. So um, yeah, that structure is is the big the big key and and uh, allowing that single brand.